I need another volunteer. This is a, it's kind of interesting. I just, I didn't think about it until we were worshiping. For years, we, we had a person who was here every Wednesday, and they'd always dim the lights in the back. There's just two switches that you have to turn off when worship would begin, and then they'd turn back on the bright lights for Bible study. So that person went home to be with the Lord. And uh, so if there's somebody else who's here consistently, I need a new volunteer to do that, to, to have the lights off when we first come in uh, predominantly and then flick on two lights when we, we come. So, all right, we got a new volunteer. Thank you very much. Get with me afterwards and I'll show you how to do it. So, all right. All right, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Proverbs. Does anybody remember where we were? I know it's been a little while since we've been here. Proverbs chapter 23 is where we ready, are ready tonight. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you are a man given to appetite. In other words, don't be a pig with rich people, okay? That, and then it goes on. This that next part is kind of funny too. Do not desire his delicacies for they are deceptive food. You also have to always wonder what is the motive behind all of this? Is there something that they're wanting in return? And verse number four, do not overwork to be rich because of your own understanding cease will you set your eyes on that which is not for riches certainly make themselves wings they fly away like an eagle towards heaven you know money talks right you know what it says most of the time goodbye <laughs> we studied this a little bit on Sunday and again, when we look at the scriptures in Timothy, Paul writes in Timothy, but those who desire to be rich, that's 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 9, when you desire to be rich, if you love money, you will never have money enough. And in doing so, it says they fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. If you saw any of the video clips from the Grammys on Sunday night, Katy Perry did a full-on open, Illuminati, demonic, I, I mean, even the liberal media is calling it demonic. And it was absolutely amazing. You know what breaks my heart about her? Her dad's a pastor. I, I read something that he wrote. He said, please pray for my devil child. She, she's openly said that she's given her soul to Satan. And again, my friends, people do sell themselves. What is it going to profit you if you gain the whole world and lose or forfeit your soul? It goes on to say, in talking about money, where Paul's writing this young pastor, he says, for the love of money, it's not money itself, money is amoral, it doesn't matter, but it's the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for what some which some have strayed from their faith in their greediness, and they have pierced themselves through with many sorrows. In verse number 17, it goes on to say that, or in verse number, yeah, verse number 17, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Riches are uncertain. If you have a lot of money involved in the stock market, you're probably a little bit concerned tonight because it took a big drop today and uh, they're afraid that it's going to drop more. But again, what we have to understand, everything here, everything in this life is uncertain. And, and here's sort of the funny thing. Don't you think that more money would make you relax more? But you know what the reality is? Many times it works just the opposite. I remember when my first son was born. My mom flew out to California to be with us. 
My dad phoned up. Now, I hadn't talked to him. Uh, you know, he, he phoned up, and he, we had just gotten home from the hospital, and here's how the conversation went. Hello? Is mom there? I said, yep, just a minute. Gave the phone to my mom, and he was worried about some financial deal, and then he hung up. No, is the baby alive? Are you guys alive? And, and you see, rather than it bringing some sort of peace, it was just, it, it was a worry that was there. And again, money's not bad. That's not what I'm saying. But if you have the love of money, it's like drinking salt water, you'll never be satisfied. You'll never ever get enough of it in your life. And it doesn't matter how much you have, it won't give you peace. And it's uncertain riches, and they're going to fly away anyway. That's what this scripture out of the book of Proverbs declares. Now the scripture goes on to say this. I like this one. Don't eat the bread of a miser. Okay, you get invited over to stingy people. Don't take anything from them. They're not going to like it. Nor desire his delicacies. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And it says, eat, he says, eat and drink. But his heart is not with you. And the morsel you have eaten, you will vomit up and waste your pleasant words. Okay, that's how a stingy guy is. Now, in verse number nine, do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the wisdom of your words. If I've learned anything uh, through my life, it's this. I don't give my opinion unless people really want it. I, I find it even in counseling sessions. Because through the years, I found some people don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. What they, what they want in going to a counseling session is someone to agree with them and tell them what they want to hear. And whenever I begin to sense that that may be the situation, I'll just flat out ask him, do you want to do what the Word of God says to do? Because the reality is, if you don't want to do what God's Word says to do, then I am the wrong person to talk to. You know who you need to talk to? You need to go to a psychiatrist and pay him $100 an hour, and I guarantee you, he's going to want you to come back as often as you want to. But for if you don't want to to hear the Word of God and say, this is what the Bible says, and this is what I'm going to do then I'm not your guy. And I've learned, you know, there's no point in me giving an opinion to anybody who doesn't want my opinion. So, you know, just keep your opinions to yourself unless people really desire it. That's what it says. Don't speak in the hearing of a fool. He will despise the wisdom of your words. Do not remove the ancient landmark, nor enter the field of the fatherless. Again, I was a farmer, so I understand this. The farmlands, especially in Israel, is still this way today. You can see some of the ancient boundaries over there. You can still see some of the walls that were built, you know, in Bible times are still there. So it's saying, don't move the ancient boundaries. Now, my friends, we still have boundaries here. If, if you go out in the corner of the street over here, you know what you're going to find? you're going to find a survey marker. And if you go in the corner of this street, you're going to find a survey marker. And, and the country has been lined out that way. But in the ancient world, it wasn't that way. There were just rocks. The, this is the boundary rock. And basically what it's saying, don't go moving it. And don't take advantage of someone who's fatherless because the Lord's going to see. For their Redeemer, in verse number 11, is mighty, and He will plead their cause against you. Now, verse number 12 is telling us we always have to be willing to listen. We always have to be willing to learn. Obviously, that's why you're here tonight, right? We never get to the point in life where we shouldn't desire to learn what God's Word says. So it says, apply your heart to instruction and your ears to words of knowledge. Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him, you shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Now my friends, in the New Testament, we're told in the book of Ephesians in chapter 6, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Another translation of that is, I brought you into this world and I'll take you out. <laughs> it goes on to say, 
And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and the admonition of the Lord. We live in a very difficult day because the Bible does not in any way advocate beating a child to the point that there's going to be blood and bruises and that. That's not at all what the scripture teaches. Again, we have to look at the entirety of the scripture. But unfortunately, we live in a day and age now where that pendulum has swung so much to the other side that it's hard for parents to discipline children. Because they're told when they go off to school, you know, to report their parents and those types of things. And CPS coming in, and I've seen it happen with good families where there really wasn't anything wrong, but some overzealous person. And, and again, the Board of Education to the Seat of Learning, it, it didn't destroy my life. Now, again, there's no place for losing control and beating a child. I mean, and again, it was those examples that gave rise to the laws that we have. I, I actually feel sorry for parents because it's a, it's a difficult situation. When we were raising our kids, Dobson uh, came out and he said, you shouldn't spank a child with your hand. Use your hands for loving. And he suggested a wooden spoon because it'd be hard to kill a child with a wooden spoon, you know. And it, it, even if you lost control a little bit, if you were just spanking them on the body, you couldn't hurt them. You know, just a flimsy little wooden spoon. But today, it's an altogether different thing. But here's the thing. Kids do need to know there's a consequence to doing wrong. That's what's been lost. And thus... Now we have an entire generation of kids who are out of control. And again, there's a wisdom and a balance at the Word of God. But again, we live in a very, very difficult thing. And I feel sorry for parents today in, in raising their kids. There's other ways to discipline, obviously. The Lord wants you to be compassionate. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians, fathers don't provoke your children. There's never a place for a parent to be out of control. And I know there were a few times that I provoked my kids. And, and again, there's a balance and a wisdom that is laid out in the scripture. It goes on. Now here's the soft side. My son, if your heart is wise, my heart will rejoice. I indeed, I myself. Yes, my inmost being will rejoice when your lips speak right things. Now, I do have to say something. It's way better being a grandparent than a parent. You want candy? No problem. <laughs> Have all you want. Does it matter that it's dinner time? No, no, no. <laughs> Have all you want. And when you get home, climb the walls for your parents, you know. <laughs> there is a bit of sweet revenge over it, you know. <laughs> I remember one of my kids put on Facebook, has anybody seen the book on raising teenagers? I texted him personally and I said, the last time I saw it, you were eating it. <laughs> and so there, there becomes this like, oh, this is kind of fun. Let's pull up a chair and watch. <laughs> but there is a wonderful place of being a grandparent. And the other thing that you realize, I mean, as parents, sometimes you get so excited over things. And it's like, oh. Don't get excited over this. There's bigger things than this coming in your life, you know. Just relax here. All right, it goes on in verse 17. Do not let your heart envy sinners. Now, sometimes you look at the rich and famous, and you just go, oh, man, wouldn't, wouldn't it be nice to live like that? This is actually going to be a scripture we're going to be seeing a bunch tonight. But in the fear of the Lord, continue all day long. For surely there is a hereafter, and your hope will not be cut off. Hear, my son, and be wise, and guide your heart in the way. Do not mix with wine-bibbers or with gluttonous eaters of meat. For the drunkard and a glutton will come to poverty, and drowsiness will clothe a man with rags. Listen to your father who begot you and do not despise your mother when she is old. Buy the truth and do not sell it. Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. The father of the righteous will greatly rejoice and he who begets a wise child will delight in him. Let your father and your mother be glad. 
Let her who bore you rejoice. It's a wonderful thing to raise up and, and be a child that your parents can be proud of. I, I think it's a call of God upon every single one of us that we live our life in that way. The scripture goes on. My son, give me your heart and let your eyes observe my ways. For a harlot is a deep pit, and a seductress is a narrow well. She also lies in wait for a victim and increases the unfaithful among men. Every once in a while you'll see this on the news. Someone will fall in a narrow well. The problem with a narrow well as, well, as they fall down there, they're stuck. There's nothing they can do. There's no wiggle room. They, you can't get out of the situation. A deep pit is the same way. You fall into it and how are you going to be able to get out of it? And this is what the Bible says. This is what adultery is. This is what a harlot is. And, and again, my friends, we have to remember what the Word of God lays out. How does that all begin? How, how does an affair or adultery begin? It doesn't begin by jumping in bed. It begins with an emotional relationship where that sweet thing at work laughs at all your jokes. Your wife thinks you're stupid, but she's just, oh, 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 oh. you're so funny. And, you know, the Bible describes it as an ox going to the slaughter. And men are just dumb. Ooh, well, let me tell you more. And what ends up happening is an emotional relationship ends up taking place there. And my friends, I want to tell you something. It doesn't take long to ruin your life. And you know what? You can't hide it. It will eventually surface. And there's going to be pain. Some people get over it, and I admire them. But it's a difficult thing to get over. Jesus said, it is a clause for divorce. And, and part of the reason it's that clause is some people could never ever get over it. But here's the thing, really? Is that what you want in your life? You want to throw away everything in your life for that? And, and so that's why that warning comes all the way through the Proverbs. It comes through scriptures and all other places. And everybody has to guard themselves so that they never get in a situation that that emotional relationship ends up taking place. Does that make sense? The next part. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those that linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. Do not look at wine when it is red when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly, and at last it bites like a serpent. It stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. And yes, you will be like the one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like the one who lies at the top of the mast saying, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? One in nine people who take the first drink, will never be able to stop. And you see, my friends, you have no idea whether that's you or not. Your kids have no idea whether it's them or not. And my friends, it doesn't take long, and I'm be willing to say everyone in this room at some point in their life was affected by somebody who was addicted to drug or alcohol. And when that's the case, this is the description of it. You know, it says, who has woe, who has sorrows, who has complaints, who has wounds without cause? My dad was an alcoholic. Now, I'll tell you a few things about my dad. Everybody loved my dad. My dad was the life of the party. 
Hardly anybody ever saw the side of my dad that I'm, I'm going to talk about. My dad was the one who was at a party, was telling all the jokes, everybody was laughing with, everybody thought, man, Bud Hagerman is just a great guy. My dad could drink beer all day long and still function. We drove brand new Lincoln Continentals. My dad never hit me. But there was a whole nother side. He had wounds all the time. They had no idea where he got. Because once he started drinking Jack Daniels whiskey, it was an entirely different story. So countenance changed. Everything about him changed. I could tell whether he bought a bottle, even if it wasn't open yet, by the way he drove the pickup. Not that he was drunk. I, I could just tell by his countenance. And, and here's the thing. He wrecked more cars and pickups than most people own in two lifetimes. Fortunately, we lived out in the middle of nowhere and he never ran into anybody. But he would literally, from one ditch to the other ditch to the other ditch to the other ditch, get stumbling drunk. I didn't realize it until I was about 13 years old. And at 13... I thought it was my fault. I remember coming home from school once and my, uh, my mom was gone. My dad was stumbling drunk outside. Now, we never kept alcohol in the house, never one bit. Never, you never opened the refrigerator and there was a beer. There was never a liquor cabinet, anything like that. My dad was stumbling drunk and I, I think back on this and it, it's so funny now. I, I, I decided it was my fault at 13 so I was going to kill myself. I went in the kitchen and my mom... We had chickens and raised chickens. And again, this, you know, parents today are so limited. My mother would rip off a chicken head with her bare hands. And that chicken would be running across the yard with blood spurting out of its neck. And when she looked at me and said, I'm going to wring your neck, I believed her. <laughs> I, I never in my life talked back to that woman. I... I <laughs> Parents are so limited today. I mean, you know, from birth on, kids need to see this kind of thing. You know, they'd have a different respect for their parents. <laughs> but my mom had this gigantic butcher knife. And I, I still remember, I, grabbed, I opened the door. I had the butcher knife ready to plunge it into my belly. It's funny now. You know why I didn't? I thought, this is going to hurt. <laughs> now... I'll tell you how God saved me, though. 20 feet away was five rifles and three pistols all unlocked and loaded. But God just preserved me. But here's the deal. I poured out $10,000 worth of Jack Daniels whiskey. There was never one time my dad ever told me not to do that. There was never one time that I got in trouble for it. You know why? I don't think he wanted to drink. But the drink had him. And I can remember as a kid going, I'm never going to be that way. I'm never going to be a dad that my kids have to be ashamed to come home. And, and aren't going to want to bring their friends for fear that I'm stumbling drunk. Well, the last verse of this, it says, When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? Now, I wasn't a Christian at this time. And I still drank, and I got involved in drugs somewhat, but I never got very involved in it because I, was, I never wanted to be out of control. But I remember one time, and it was about six months before I got saved, I would partied all night long. I was going to college. I had an 8 o'clock class. My buddy and I, who had drank all night long, were sitting outside the college class, and we still had beer in the back seat, and we both popped a can of Coors. And I remember when I put it to my lips at 8 o'clock in the morning, there was an overwhelming thought I had become my father. Changed my life. Six months later, I asked Jesus into my heart. My friends, I want you to know something. Drunkenness is always a sin. The very first drunk in the Bible is, do you remember it? We just studied it. Who was it? Noah. And it was a sordid tale of what ends up going on there. And again, there are decisions that we can make in our life. My wife, Marilee, has never had a drink of alcohol in her life. She raised her son to be that way. BJ has never had a drink of alcohol in his life. I don't know about you, but I'm really happy we got a, a, a youth pastor that's never had a drink. Because I think sometimes kids don't think that's possible to grow up and not be a part of the world. But my friends... 
We've got to make those decisions for ourselves. You know what happens when people get drunk? They say things that they wouldn't normally say, and they do things that they wouldn't normally do. Most affairs, you know what they have involved with it? Alcohol. Because it changes you, and you'll do and say things that you wouldn't normally do. My friends... You want your kids to grow up and be afraid to bring their friends home. That's why we can't live that way. We got to eradicate it out of our life. Okay? Chapter 24. Again, the same truth. Do not be envious of evil men. We're going to see this three different times tonight. Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them. For their heart devises violence, and their lips talk of troublemaking. Now, verse number three is a great scripture for building Christian families. Through wisdom is a house built, and by understanding it is established. And by knowledge the rooms are filled with precious and pleasant riches. Again, you know, we have an opportunity for this coming up. If you're married, come to a marriage retreat. Have, if you got grown kids, maybe pay for your grown kids to come to the marriage retreat if they're married. And as we look at this, we got to see we've got to grow in knowledge in every way. And as we grow in knowledge, we can live a better life We can have a better family. We can do what the Lord desires us to do. The Bible says my people perish for a lack of knowledge. And when we simply desire, Lord, I want your truth in my home. I want your truth in my family. It changes everything. I I was talking with one of our teachers today, and there's a Disney show, and I'm sorry, I forget which one it is, but it's basically shooting at the ages of 5 to 13, and it's one of the kids' shows that she said she let her kids watch on Disney. Well, I, I forget, I think it was this week she told me, on that show, two lesbian moms. And it was like just trying to indoctrinate the kids again. And, and it, it was like, you know, we, we try to tell them the truth. And we have to understand. That's why, you know, again, your kids need all of Jesus that they can get in every way, shape, and form. And uh, if you haven't signed up for the youth retreat yet, get your kids there. The scripture goes on. A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength. For by wise counsel you will wage your own war. And I love this next verse. In a multitude of counselors there is safety. And my friends, it's so important in our lives. I'll tell you a little bit about our church. We have a board of elders here. As we discuss things, we never move ahead on a decision that we don't have a unanimous agreement on. Because if there's one or two elders that don't feel like it's a good thing, then that's going to equate to several hundred people who feel the same thing. On really big things that's going to impact everyone, we'll come and talk about it. You know, we'll share it with the whole church. In the multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. And we can know so that we we don't make mistakes in our lives. Uh, Marilee and I were watching something on TV. This woman got a call and said that she won the Jamaican lottery and all they needed was for her to send $400 so they could transfer the money. Now I want to tell you something. Her husband was a doctor. She sent the $400. Then they need $1,000. Then they needed $2,000. Then the phone calls became threatening and they were going to kill him. Do you know what they did? They spent $750,000. If they would have asked a few people, I don't know about you, but I have friends in Nigeria that write me every week. And tell me that someone wants to give me five million dollars in Nigeria if I'll just give him my banking information. 
So again, there's wisdom in a multitude of counselors. In verse number 7, wisdom is too lofty for a fool. He does not open his mouth wide in the gate. He who plots to do evil will be called a schemer, and the devising of foolishness is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to men. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. There's a scripture in Ephesians where it talks about the battle that we face. And it, it lays out that we need to know our enemy and the schemes. It lays out that we do not battle against flesh and blood. It's one of the things that we've been going through on Wednesday nights. And the, last week the, uh, the video that we had was all a part of that. We, we need to know that we do not battle against flesh and blood. But there are powers and principalities and we're going to face spiritual battles. And it goes on in Ephesians to say this. When you have done everything that that you can do to stand. What are you to do? When we have done everything that we can do to stand, what? Stand, therefore. Now we have to understand something. The tactic of the enemy is to discourage us. <coughs> discourage us to the point that we want to quit. Discourage us to the point where we want to turn tail and run. And again, when you look at the full armor of God, there's nothing for the back, is there? So if we turn tail and run, we, we don't have defenses. So what do we have to do when we've done everything that we can do to stand? Stand. Do you realize all we have to do is show up? We show up and God gives the victory. I cannot tell you in my life how many times my life has felt like this. I'm standing on the seashore and there is a tsunami coming. And I'm looking at it going, this one's going to get me. This is it. This is going to be the end one. And the next thing I know, it's past. I'm wet a little bit. You go, no, you're a lot wet. But I'm still standing there. And you know what? It didn't destroy me. Now I have to tell you, there's another tsunami coming. There will always be. But we have to understand, in the day of adversity, we just got to stand. All we have to do is show up. That's it. We show up. The Lord promises, I'm going to give you the victory. You stand firm. So if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. It goes on, deliver those who are drawn towards death and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. If you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who waits a heart consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? Will he not render to each man according to his deeds? The Lord knows all things. Uh, first of all, we can't hide anything from God. Do you all realize that? The only way that we get over the hidden sins in our life is what? Confessing our sin. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. But here the scripture says, we got to be those ones that are out there rescuing the perishing. And we can't use the excuse, well, I didn't know. When we do know. It's a different thing if we really didn't know. I, I'm going to tell a story on Marilee and embarrass her a little bit. She's going, what are you telling? <laughs> Marilee and I saw a boy walking. And this boy looked so sad. And it, his countenance was just like overwhelmingly sad. And I, I forget, we had to be somewhere we drove by. And we talked about him. And we just said, you know, how hard it must be for him that he looked so sad. And unbeknownst to me, merely said to the Lord, if I ever see that boy again, I'm going to stop. Well, she saw him again. She stopped. And she gave him her, her, her card. And she said, I just want to tell you something. Jesus loves you. 
And God has a special plan for your life. And he loves you so much. And, he, and she said, here, I want to give you 20 bucks. And he said, no, I don't need any money. I'm, I'm rich. But we were talking later. Who knows? Maybe that boy was thinking about, I'm going to go home and commit suicide. We never know what's going on in a person's heart or life. But when we have the opportunity and the Lord speaks to our hearts, let's follow through with it. Let's actually do it. And that's basically what the scripture here is saying. In verse 13, My son, eat honey because it is good. And the honeycomb which is sweet to your taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul. If you have found it, there is a prospect and your hope will not be cut off. Do not lie in wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the right. Don't worry, that's my phone. <laughs> But it's not actually in my possession, so I'll blame my wife. She's the one that was holding it. I saw it. It was in your hand. So. <laughs> that's pretty good. I think that's a first. My own phone is going off. Do not plunder his resting place. For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. This is an important thing. You know what? A righteous man may fall five, uh, seven times. It, it is something. If you've ever studied the life of Abraham Lincoln, he faced defeat after defeat after defeat after defeat after defeat. He went bankrupt. I mean, all kinds of things happened in his life. And then he was elected president of the United States of America and became one of the greatest presidents and carried our nation through one of the darkest times in its history. So, for a righteous man may fall seven times, but he will rise again. It's not the fact that we fall. That's not wrong. It's the fact that we don't learn from our falls and some people get, uh, give up and they don't get back up. Now the next verse is hard. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. That's hard to do. There's a little part of us that go, good. <laughs> and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest the Lord see it, and it displeases him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Now again, verse number 19. It goes with verse number 1 in chapter 24, and verse 17 and 23. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of wicked people. For there will be no prospect for the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. My son, fear the Lord and the king, and do not associate with the those given to change, for their calamity will arise suddenly, and who knows the ruin that those two can bring. The Bible tells us in the book of James, chapter 1, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man and unstable in all his ways. We need to step forward. And when God speaks to our hearts, we need to go through with it. Now, my friends, I've never stepped forward in something with the Lord that at some moment of their life there hasn't been a fear and a panic. It's like, oh, Lord, if you don't do this, it's going to be terrible. I mean, actually, Merrily has just lived through that. Here, back in September, Marilee woke up one day and she, you know, I was getting up. I don't even think I'd had my first cup of coffee yet. Marilee looked at me and she said, we're supposed to buy Pastor Saeed a house. I said, really? <laughs> okay. And then she said, no, I mean, we're supposed to like do a nationwide campaign, you know, to, to raise money for it. And I said, well, okay. And... We got into this project, and we had, you know, it had gone three or four weeks, and I think we had $25,000 or something, and it came time for the pastor's wife conference. So Marilee went to the pastor's wife conference, and Nagme was speaking. She was the first one. 
And so after Nagme spoke, the person that was heading up the retreat, you know, put her arm around Nagme and said, Nagme, what can we do to help you? And Nagme's very humble, very gracious, very kind. And she said, well, of course, pray. And, and then the lady said, well, what else can we do to help you? And Nagme looked over and Marilee was sitting over here and she goes, well, you can talk to Marilee Hagerman. <laughs> and the person sitting beside Marilee said, you need to get up there. You need to share what you're doing. Now, you know, Marilee always looks nice, doesn't she? Okay. Marilee was wearing high heels that hurt her feet and she had taken her shoes off and they were the kind that you had to strap on and she knew that if she went down to strap her shoes on that the moment was going to pass. And so they said, go up barefoot. So Marilee, like a queen, goes up on stage barefoot in front of a thousand pastor's wives and she, and she said her heart was just beating so fast and shared with them. You know, the thing that God was doing. And afterwards, she called me and she said, I can't believe that. They're going to kick me out of Calvary Chapel. I was on stage barefoot, you know. But here's the thing. God did it. Isn't that awesome? I am happy to tell you we're at $155,000 now. Isn't that super? <laughs> but you got to keep going forward. The scripture goes on to say in verse 23, these things also belong to the wife. Um, and by the way, pray for Pastor Saeed. The most encouraging thing yet out of Iran, the foreign minister of Iran has actually talked about the possibility of Saeed having clemency. And it's been our prayer all the way through. And, and Nagme has asked us to hold on to the money because she said, I want Pastor Saeed on my side and pick out this house together. So let's pray that as we get to this point, Saeed gets out and together they can pick a home. Hallelujah. So, Lord Jesus, we as a family of believers and as believers around the world, we do pray for Pastor Saeed and the other persecuted Christians there as well. And Lord, we pray that you would swing open those prison doors in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 23, these things also belong to the wise. It is not good to show partiality in judgment. He who says to the wicked, you are righteous, him the people will curse, nations will abhor him, and those who re rebuke the wicked will have delight and a good blessing will come upon them. He who gives a right answer kisses the lips. Prepare your outside work. Make it fit for yourself in the field and afterwards build your house. Do not be a witness against your neighbor without cause. For would you deceive with your lips? Do, do not say I will do to him just as he has done to me. I will render to the man according to his work. I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of a man devoid of understanding. And there it was, all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with needles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. And I looked on it and received instruction. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And so your poverty will come like a prowler and your want like an armed man. Growing up on the farm, I actually saw people who were lazy who were lazy farmers. When it came time for the crops, they, they didn't have good crops to begin with. They weren't ready to harvest their crops. And they barely eked out an existence. I, I want to tell you something. In the Bible, God always calls busy people. He always calls people who are doing something. Within the ministry, and it's, it's one of the things that makes our Bible college unique, because just knowledge puffs up. And so, so many places, kids go off and they just, they study and they learn things in books and they just sit around and have debates and at the end of the day, they don't do anything with it. It hasn't really prepared them for real ministry. They're living in a delusion of what it's going to be. But here, our Bible college students work and they work hard and their schedules are very demanding. You know why? Because that's the reality of ministry. And that's why when people go on and they go out and start ministries, they do them. 
You know, Chris and Lydia up in Tooele, when they went there, they had church in their house. Three times a week, they had their house full of people. All right? Plus, they had people living with them for eight months. Everything that was done, whether it was a potluck or whatever, was in, in their home. When they got their facility, guess what? Every single night, they were working on it. Every single Saturday, they physically were doing it and working on it. They were setting up the chairs. They were cleaning up, cleaning the bathroom. They're still doing all of that stuff. And there's more people now. But here's the reality. If you're lazy, it's never going to happen. And within the ministry, there is no place for lazy people. But in practicality of life, it is exactly the same way. This is saying, hey, you know what? You want to be lazy, your poverty will come to you like a prowler and your want like an armed man. Chapter 25. These are also, uh, these also are the proverbs of Solomon, which the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. Now, I love the story of Hezekiah. We read about it in 2 Kings chapter 18, also in 2 Chronicles chapter 29. And it was a time of national revival in Israel. If you were to look at Israel's history, it, here's what it would be like, a role roller coaster. Okay, that's Israel's history. And when things started going good, Israel fell away from the Lord. When they went into bondage or times of terrible trouble, then they called out to the Lord. The Lord helped them. When things got better, they fell away from the Lord and they went back into bondage. Is that your life? If you were to chart your Christian life, what does it look like? Is it a roller coaster? Or is it sort of a plane that's ever going up? That's where we need to be. We need to be ever growing in the Lord. That's the narrow way. It's the mountain way. It, broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there are that go there. So here's what happened. Hezekiah turned his heart to the Lord. There was a national revival. I don't know about you, but I'm hoping in 2016, Hezekiah runs for president and gets elected. But here's the deal. There was a national revival that took place. And immediately they would be attacked by the Assyrians. The Assyrians predated the Babylonians. The Assyrians were the most brutal people alive. They, when they conquered an area, tortured the people so much. There, there is historical accounts of entire cities that got surrounded where everybody committed suicide rather than fall into their hands. They put hooks through their noses strip people naked, put hooks through their noses and would chain people one to another to haul them back to Assyria. It was brutal. Skinning people. I, I just, it, it, a brutal people. They came to Jerusalem. Now my friends, if you've ever gone with me to Israel, you can stand on the Mount of Olives and you can shout across the Kidron Valley. It's not that far. And you could shout to somebody on the walls of the city of Jerusalem very easily. Okay, it's not a hard thing. And so Shennacherib had surrounded the city of Jerusalem. He had people speaking Hebrew, calling to the people on the walls, telling them what they were going to do to them when they captured them. And not one city in the history of mankind had ever withstood the Assyrian assault. Hezekiah gets the letters from Sennacherib. The, the, the captain of the Assyrians. And I love what Hezekiah does. He takes them into the house of the Lord and he spreads them out on the house of the Lord and he prays over them. And Isaiah the prophet speaks to Hezekiah and says, the Lord will deliver us. Because there were those in Israel, in Jerusalem, who are saying, we need to capitulate. We need to go to Egypt for help. We need to do other things. But Isaiah and Hezekiah stood firm. And I want to tell you something. God delivered the nation of Israel and all of the Assyrians were killed. 185,000 of them in one night by the angel of the Lord. So this is that Hezekiah. Hezekiah. When I go to Israel, we go through Hezekiah's tunnel. 
that brought water into the city prior to this time of siege. You can still see it today. You can still see the wall that Hezekiah added. We, we actually walk right over this wall of Hezekiah. So the archaeological proof is great there. And it says, It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. As the heavens for the height and the earth for the depth, so the heart of the king is unsearchable. Take away the dross from silver and it will go to the silversmith for jewelry. Take away the wicked from before the king and his throne will be established in righteousness. Now in verse 6 and 7, Jesus actually makes a parable out of this. Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of great men. For it is better that he say to you, come up here, than you should be put lower in the presence of the prince whom your eyes have seen. In Luke chapter 14, Jesus said this. He told him a parable in Luke 14, 7, to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the best seats, saying to them, when you're invited to anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down at the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him come to you and say, give place to this man. Then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit at the lowest place so that when he who invites you comes, he may say to you, friend, go up higher. Then you will have glory in the presence of those who sat at the table with you. Yeah, I'll tell you something about head tables. I think head tables are stupid. You ever looked at the head table? When you're sitting at the head table, nobody's sitting across from you, right? You're on display. So if you drop something, you know, everybody's going to snicker at you. I got to tell you what happened to me tonight. Marilee and I have some friends from Washington, and so we took him out to eat at the New Asian Buffet place. And I love the uh, sushi. And so I, I have this bowl of teriyaki and the wasabi, you know. I have this light, light blue shirt on. I don't still have it on, you notice, right? <laughs> now, I got to tell you, at least three-fourths of the restaurant is Joshua Springs, uh, 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 half of the four o'clock service was there, and some of you were there as well. And, and so I, I, I've got my chopsticks, and I got this, you know, this uh, uh, new piece of sushi that I'm eating. Full on, drop it a foot into my wasabi and 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 uh, uh, teriyaki sauce all over me. I mean, it just splatters. And now, you know, I look like a, I, I look like a mess. All right. I look so bad, the little Chinese waitress comes over and she starts washing my shirt. I, everybody in the restaurant is laughing themselves to death. It was hysterical. It barely is just laughing at me. And I said, you better be nice to me or I'll take off my shirt. And I just have a wife beater on. I said, that'll be enough to make everybody sick, you know. And, but, but here's the thing, when you're sitting at a head table, you can't even visit. And, and you look out at everyone else at the wedding reception, sitting around the round tables, and they're all laughing and having fun. So as far as I'm concerned, don't ever set me at a head table. I'd far rather be sitting with people and laughing and having fun. But here again, this is, this is a place where Jesus got this and made a parable out of it. In verse number 8, do not go hastily to court, for what will you do in the end when your neighbor has put you to shame? A New Testament principle again, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says in verse 1, dare any of you having a matter against another go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world and that the world will be judged by you? Are you unworthy to judge in the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge the angels? How much more the things that pertain in life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there's not a wise man among you? No, not even one who will be able to judge between he and his brother. But if a brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers, now therefore it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why would you not rather accept wrong? Within the family of believers... 
Lawsuits have to be the last place. We ought to be able to work it out. I'll, I'll never forget a situation that we had once. A couple in the church got divorced. Messy situation. They eventually both ended up getting remarried. And as there is in all divorces, there were custody issues and, and uh, child support payment issues. But I got a phone call once and they said, we would like to sit down with you and work this out. So both sides came in, I sat there in my office, and we worked out the custody issues, we worked out the uh, support issues, and they never did have to go to court. And you know what was great for the kids? They could stay in church. For everything that had been divided in their life, at least church wasn't. And both sides were there. So there is a way and a place that you can make that work. The scripture goes on to say... Debate your case with your neighbor himself and do not disclose the secret to another lest he who hears it expose your shame and your reputation be ruined. I like verse number 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in settings of silver. Isn't it wonderful when someone says something that can diffuse a situation? Something that's, that's just a wonderful thing to say. Those people are a great blessing. Then there are those people who are always saying something stupid. They need to keep their mouth shut. If you have a reputation of saying stupid things, don't say so much. You know, don't walk up to someone and go, have you gained weight? You look fat. Okay? That's not the right thing to say. Okay? The scripture goes on. Like an earring of gold, like an ornament of fine gold, is a wise reprover to obedient ear. Like the cold of snow in time of harvest is a faithful messenger to those who send him, for he refreshes the soul of his masters. Whoever falsely boasts of giving is like a cloud and wind without rain. By a long forbearance, a ruler is persuaded, and a gentle tongue breaks a bone. Have you found honey? Eat only as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and vomit. You can't eat too much of anything, and it's not good. I like this one. Seldom set foot in your neighbor's house, lest he become weary of you and hate you. All right? <laughs> A man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club is like a club and a sword and a sharp arrow. Confidence in an unfaithful man in a time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. If you confide something in somebody who's not trustworthy, they're going to come back on you. And it's going to be like a toothache. You ever had a bad toothache? I mean, nothing's closer to your brain, right? And the sharp shooting pain or like a bone out of joint. That's why if you're married, you know who your closest confidant needs to be? Each other. It's a wonderful blessing. You ever had somebody that you told somebody to in confidence and they stabbed you in the back? Anybody here? Yeah, I'm thinking everybody here. The scripture goes on. A man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club and a sword and a sharp arrow. Take confidence to the unfaithful man in a time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot out of joint. Like one who takes away a garment in cold weather and like vinegar on soda is one who sings songs to a heavy heart. It's like a volcano blowing up there. Jesus would again elaborate on this. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. For so you will heap coals of fire on his head, and the Lord will reward you. In the book of Romans, the scripture is repeated for us. In Romans chapter 12, the scripture says, in verse 18, If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. My friends, I want to tell you something. It doesn't do you any good to have a bitterness against somebody. 
Because that bitterness isn't going to hurt them, but it will destroy your life. It will destroy your spouse's life. It will destroy your kids' life. And it will destroy those who are closest to you. But the person that you're bitter against, they're probably sleeping like a baby. They're not touching them at all. The Bible's clear on this. And here's the thing. When we're kind to people, even our enemies, you know what the Bible says? It's like heaping coals on their head. Now it's upon them. A powerful lesson for us. Verse 23. The north brings forth rain and back, a backbiting tongue and angry countenance. This guy must have been having trouble with his wife. It's better to dwell in the corner of a housetop than a house shared with a contentious woman. As cold water to a weary soul, so is good news from a far country. And a righteous man who falters before the wicked is like a murky spring in a polluted well. It's not good to eat too much honey, so to seek one's own glory is not glory. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. My friends, in the book of Galatians chapter 6, it talks about the, the lust of the flesh. It says it's obvious, and the lust of the flesh is adultery and murder and lying and all those. But you know what else it says that the, is the lust of the flesh? Outbursts of wrath. And my friends, it goes on to say that the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. You know whether you're a person that has outbursts of wrath. And you know what? You've got to stop blaming it on your Irish blood. You got to realize it's sin. It's something that God doesn't want. God never wants us to be out of control. And outbursts of wrath are being out of control. Instead, we're to have the fruit of the Spirit.